Welcome to part two of the STRI cast on development. Uh, so Neil, yeah, we're just finishing off talking about the concept stage uh, of design process. Uh, I was just talking about when we're involved with the larger projects, that's an iterative process involving a team of people and everything that's done at that point uh, is adding layers onto our uh, initial design. So we've designed the sporting facilities or the, the uh, urban intervention to the maximum parameters that we feel are necessary for this type of scheme, but other people are having their input then. So it might be security, it might be um, site-wide drainage, it might be access, it might be a number of different things uh, that are all adding to that, that, that final design, if you like. Yeah, and it might be phasing as well. That's something we've not touched on. On a lot of the bigger projects, the phasing is, is important, particularly some of the school ones where you have to have certain areas you know, in play by a certain time. Um, so it's always good to look at that at that concept stage as well, because that's going to have a big implication on, on your design, but also how things are constructed and the sort of construction program and time scales and things like that. So that's something that needs to be like clearly set out and defined during the, the, the sort of early concept stage. Okay, great. And then in terms of uh, the smaller schemes we've touched upon, we probably wouldn't be involved in that level of um, sort of systematic meetings, regular meetings, um, but we would still go through a similar process ourselves in terms of producing a concept, introducing that to the client, talking them through why we've done various bits, and then getting that feedback from them. And at that point, although it might not be formalised through a, a big programme of works, we'd probably still in engage with stakeholders again, wouldn't we? So maybe club users or potential users of the site. Yeah, that's right. We, 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 would, we would do an initial sort of concept design, engage with stakeholders, make sure everyone's happy, essentially get it signed off by the client. And then we would then take that into the into the more detailed design and the information that would go out to contractors to, to build. Mm. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's a similar, it's just not as well defined. It's a similar process. We always like to do this sort of concept thing so that we've, we've got a complete clear picture of what it is we want to do, get that all agreed and discussed and with all the stakeholders before we progress into the, the nitty gritty of the detailed design. And then just in terms of, of those smaller projects, again, at, at this stage, at concept stage, would that be enough information to engage with contractors? Or is there a stage? No, we no, we, we would then, before we engage with contractors, th th this concept thing's all about the client and the stakeholders, yeah. really. Before we get onto the, the the contractors, we would do a far more detailed, a far more detailed design process. It's sort of, you know, very detailed drawings, written specifications, that kind of thing that just gives them all the information they need to be able to price up that job and then to con construct that job. Okay. So I guess uh, at this point then, we've, Again, recapping, feasibility, uh, stakeholder engagement. Um, we've done initial concept designs. We've got sign off from the client. We've mm -hmm. thought about whether or not there'd be a requirement for planning permission or, or pre-app information. Assuming that we've got to the point where it, 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 we know that it will, will require a planning application, I guess the ball drops back into my court mm -hmm. and that's then about preparing a, a planning application package, submitting that planning, uh, seeing it through that process, and then at the end of that, hopefully we've achieved planning permission and then we kick back into the design phase. So I'll just talk a little bit about the, the sort of planning approach, if you like. Um, once we've got that concept, that gives us enough to uh, give the local authority an idea of the development proposals <clears throat> in a formal planning application. So there's a process to go through there in terms of pulling together the right information. Now, the level of information will vary depending on the complexity of the scheme, depending on where you are and depending on the sort of environmental circumstances, if you like. So if you've got a small scheme, a very uh, specific area, and there are no major constraints involved, then the size of the application in terms of the information that needs to be submitted can be relatively small. The alternative to that is on larger schemes, having to submit a substantial amount of information on varying different topics, depending on what it is they want from their validation criteria or what we've been told in terms of the, the pre-application response. So just by way of example, um, smaller schemes, you might be able to put in the design, a planning statement or supporting statement or a design and access statement that sets out the, the basic limitations of the scheme, uh, the layout, the use, the amount uh, of development that you're proposing, how are you going to access that development? How construction 
traffic's going to access that development. Basic information on those lines. On most schemes these days, you're probably going to have to uh, put some ecological information in there. So whether that's um, a habitat assessment or whether that has to go to the level of you know, a full ecological impact assessment, depends on local authority. You're probably going to have to have some information about um, the flood risk to the site unless you're in a zone that is, is not at risk of flooding or is at the lowest level uh, of risk of flooding. Um, and then typically you're possibly going to have some uh, landscape implications that you might need to consider uh, at that level. Um, on the bigger schemes or, or where specific information is requested, you can get a number of different things from air quality to heritage implications to... Uh, uh, arboricultural issues, um, site-wide drainage issues, or how it, how it fits into the wider uh, drainage of, of the area. You could have um, ground investigation issues, so you could be talking about contaminated land. There could be a number of different issues. On some of those, we would go to external specialists for their advice, and some of those services we've got in-house. So, for example, anything to do with contaminated land, or ground gases, or uh, leachates, we could handle in, in-house. Anything to do with flood risk, water management, uh, natural flood management, again, we can handle in-house. Likewise with ecology and landscape. Some of the more specific ones, air quality assessments, for example, noise quality assessments, lighting, uh, looks, vol- uh, looks levels, we would have to get specialists involved to, to give us that information. Um, but all of that, would then be put together within what we call the planning pack and submitted to the local authority. The length of time that it could take to put that together, again, varies on the complexity and the size of the scheme, but typically it could take anywhere from, let's say, four weeks to, uh, I don't know, three months, something along those lines. Um, And the submission process, once it's lodged with the local authority, they have a short period of time to validate that application, which means they will accept it uh, as a valid application. They'll notify you of that. And then from that point onwards, there'll be specific time frames set out. So if it's a, if it's what we call a major application, it'll be 12 week determination period. Or if it's actually deemed to be uh, an application that needs an environmental impact assessment submitted with it, it will be 16 weeks for that process. And if it's a smaller application, it'll be an eight-week process. Uh, so that's a, that's a sort of basic understanding of, of pulling a package together and submitting it. The real work, I suppose, starts from submission of the application and then working it through that process with the local authority. There's an initial four-week period of, of consultation where the local authority talk to internal consultees, if you like, so they're in-house specialists in whatever those various topics are. Sometimes they go externally depending on the authority. Uh, And then they get their initial information coming back to the planning officer who's going to make the ultimate decision. And they will start to be building up a picture of how this application appears to them. At that point, it's important for uh, our team to get back involved with the local authority, review those responses and work with the planning officer in addressing any gaps in information or or any uh, questions that have, have been raised through that process. And I can't iterate enough at this point that that is key uh, in terms of, of not uh, coming across problems in future is to address those points at this at this stage. So getting the information together, addressing any points that have come up means you're going to have less conditions attached to your application uh, uh, at the end of the process. And then in terms of the construction side of things, you're going to come across less issues because you've covered them off as best you can at that stage. <clears throat> so once it's uh, once you've gone through that initial consultation period, there'll be another either four or eight weeks, depending on, on the size of the scheme, where the local authority will be uh, taking um, responses from members of the public, other organisations, any responses we want to put forward, and they'll be building up towards making a determination If it's of significance, uh, it's more than likely going to go to a planning committee for a decision rather than being a delegated decision, which is where the officer makes the decision on behalf of the council. Um, And typically two to three weeks before the committee date or before the delegated decision date, um, the officer is going to start writing their report. And that's another chance for you to help shape 
the way that report's written. So not talking about anything underhand, but providing more information mm-hmm. if they need it, helping them to understand specific aspects of the scheme or the proposal. Uh, all helps to kind of get the officer in the right frame of mind when it comes to making that determination. And if there are any final issues to cover off, they're covered off before that decision is made. Um, determination will be given or should be given by a specific deadline. If it's not, they'll have to ask you for an extension of time and you can agree or disagree to that depending on, on whether you might want to do that tactically or not. And then determination is given. Let's say the application is successful for the purposes of this podcast. You're then into the, uh, the realms of uh, waiting for that decision to be formalised in, in paperwork terms. But at that point, assuming we've got the permission, that's when we kick back into the design process again, isn't it, uh, Neil? And we, we come back into what we probably term technical design at that stage. Yeah, that's right. And just to go back a little step, is there a question for you, James? Is there a sort of threshold for a project in planning when it would go to committee? Um, or is that kind of a subjective thing that varies from area to area? It, it can be a little bit subjective, but most major applications are probably going to be determined by a planning committee because the authority will deem that it would be uh, of a certain level of importance that council yeah. members need to make a determination on that. Certainly, if you're talking about any sort of uh, significant sporting facility with a number of pitches, whatever they may be, whatever sport they may be, that would be something of significance that would, yeah. would need a committee to make a decision. If you're talking about something that's going to have a pretty um, important or major impact on environmental considerations, then it's certainly going to go to planning committee and it may well actually go a stage further if it gets permission to be called in by the Secretary of State to be reviewed, Mm -hmm. um, depending on the level of that that potential impact or the level of importance of particular um, ecological or environmental considerations. Um, Smaller projects single pitches uh, or, you know, um, the smaller sort of interventions in the urban areas like the rain gardens, swales, those types of things, don't always have to go to planning committees. They can be uh, determined under delegated powers. Um, but again, it, it's all to do with the circumstances of the particular project and, you know, the complexities involved. Sometimes smaller schemes might have implications further down stream or, or you know within the wider community that mean it's of a level that it's going to have to be considered uh, by a committee instead of by a delegated member and then of course you've got the opportunity for uh, MPs or councillors to uh, take a particular interest in a project at that point it would mm. nearly always go to committee there wouldn't be a reason not to take it to committee if a, if a council member requested it to, to go there yeah okay all right but yeah on to the next stage of the design process and I guess the next stage is kind of there's two parts to it. It's about getting obviously into the detail. The first part is taking on board any conditions that have been raised as part of that planning application, as part of that planning um, permission that you've received. So at that point, it's a case of reviewing any design that we've already done. And, and, and often that means just tweaking things or adding things in to make sure that those conditions can be discharged and can be met. A lot of the time we're finding at the moment, it's, it's in relation to drainage and surface water and discharge rates and things like that. So it's about just reviewing it and tweaking our designs to make sure that that, that we're meeting all the right all the right things there. Um, and then it's about producing a basically a pack of information that's got sufficient detail that would allow a contractor to go and, and price up that work um, accurately um, or, or a series of contractors to price up that work accurately. So the client can then compare um, like for like costs basically that they receive back from from the contractor so at that stage we're basically producing a a pack a bit like your planning pack we're producing a pack of detailed design information that's submitted to the client and then is submitted then is is used for the tender process basically and and can be used as a sort of technical documentation at that stage so that that's things like detailed drawings um again it's written specifications we'll have some cdm information in there as our role as as a designer because we'll have been a, a designer at that point obviously because we, we've been designing things so we would have our designer risk assessment just uh, cdm now yeah so cdm is the sort of hse's um again i guess policy and guidelines about managing health and safety on any construction project so it's about 
identifying and planning and, and minimizing risk minimizing risks um, to health and safety during construction. Um, and as part of that, there's various different roles and responsibilities and, and designations. Either obviously there's the client, um, which is, which is never us. The client's the client. But then on the design side, there's either the a de, you're either a designer or the principal designer, and both of them have their own roles and responsibilities and there's big differences between the two of those um and typically i guess we'd be on the designer side yeah of typically we'd be on this that's right yeah tip, typically on the designer side so whenever you design anything whether you've done a drawing or you've a specification or you've you know drainage calculations or anything like that, at that point you're automatically a designer so you mm. do have a responsibility at that stage um to be thinking about the health and safety of the people that are going to be building this thing and the people that are then going to be using it after it's built. Mm. Um, the principal designer role is different. It's a lot, it's more involved. That There's always a principal designer if there's more than one contractor on the project. Um, and that's, their role is really to coordinate and make sure that all the right information is there. Um, so that's pulling together all of the different, you know, information from various designers and things to, p- to pull it all together and make sure everything so out, outside of the re- outside of the remit of this podcast if we were talking about say a stadium construction design project yeah. it's likely the architect would be the principal designer on that and we as say the pitch surface mm-hmm. designers would be a designer we would just be a designer that's right and they might bring in a specialist sort of health and safety like a specialist cdm yeah. uh, person we'll to, 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 to carry out that role the architect might or it might be the architect it, it varies project to project on who carries out that role but that's a very important thing to to sort of determine at the start so everyone's completely clear you don't want to get down the stage where all of a sudden you realize everyone's looking at you to be the principal designer but that's not been you know, something that's agreed at the early stages. The, the roles yeah. need to be clearly defined at, at the start. Okay, so at this point, we've got our planning permission. We've got some conditions attached to that. We've had a look at the uh, design again from a technical perspective now. We're starting to increase the information that's uh, available there, uh, getting into more detail on the specification and addressing any of those condition issues. We're putting together a pack, we call it a tender pack, and then the process from there if it was a sort of a smaller project, if you like, or a medium-sized project, would be that we would help the client run that tender process and have a look at a range of uh, suitable contractors that, that might want to be involved with the project, I guess, and then you'd be going through that process of understanding and reviewing that. That's right, yeah, and a different, different on different projects, but a lot of the time that is providing, I guess, the technical expertise to be able to... Um, I guess review the submissions, review the tender returns from from the contractors to make sure that um, yeah they've sort of priced everything, they've sort of understood all of the scope of the job, um, and to, I, I guess to look at the technical information they provide, method statements and their sort of quality response and things like that, just to help the client um, guide them through that and provide recommendations essentially. Uh, and to be clear, we wouldn't make any final decision on who would be employed to do that. No. Uh, piece of work specifically we would advise the client on the best tender response but it would be their decision it would be their instruction be their their contractor to yeah, engage with absolutely and, and in a lot of situations as well the sort of commercially sensitive ones we wouldn't be privy to any of the commercial information so we might not see the so you're the just purely the assessing the technical we're, response often we're we're purely assessing the technical completely from a te- nothing to do with price or anything like purely from the technical response and um, don't even see the, you know, the rates and the things like that. So yeah, it, it's it's different on different projects, but often we did, that's the case. We did mention at the, at the top of this podcast, I think that we have a, an in-house um, construction capability through Carry Sports, mm. and um, through the process we've just talked about there, we wouldn't be assessing a tender that came in from no. Carry Sports, for mm-hmm. example. So just to clear that that side of things up. But on specific projects, I guess you call them design and build projects, we might present a client with the option that we have the capability of of delivering these services as well, or these these, uh, facilities, and that if they wanted to to go with that process, if you like, we call it design and build, we would do the whole process we've we've been through previously Mm -hmm. and then bought on the... Again, you are right there. Again, that's identified right at the start, so it's not like we do that. Yeah, it, it... from the word go, we would sort of be having that discussion with the client about 
we have that capability. And if it was something they wanted to pursue, then we could go down that route. I suppose start. it's just, just important to highlight there's a, there's a few different options, isn't there? You know, if we're involved in a larger scheme with a bigger team, it might be the tender the tender process, which we can assist the client with, but we wouldn't be putting our own construction no. firm forward. If it's a, a design and build process that we've agreed with the client from the outset, then we, we could yeah. forward carry. And, and very often that might be a client coming to us right at the start saying, you know, we want a design and build proposal a for approach. this. Yeah. yeah. Um, and that happens that happens quite a lot as well. So yeah, the, there's various different construction contracts and ways of of doing a construction project. So we um, yeah, I guess we can cater for whatever approach the client wants to take. So moving us on to the next step then, um, we've got our permission, we've got our technical pack, we've engaged with a range of uh, construction companies, and we're we're getting to the point where we're going to uh, start work on site. Kicks back in to me, I suppose, from that perspective in the discharge of any pre-commencement conditions. So often when you get a planning permission, you'll get a range of conditions that are attached to it. And some of them are what we call pre-commencement conditions, which mean, as it suggests, they need to be discharged before you can start work on site. So that might be through providing um, written information back to local authority, or it might be providing samples of particular materials or it could be something as simple as finalising a landscape plan or finalising an ecological plan or, or, or something to that effect. But obviously it's important that those conditions are discharged so that uh, a start can be made on site without any delay. If you fail to pick these up when you get your planning permission, they can be a major cause of delay to a project moving forward. So it's really important to, to make sure that they're picked up at that stage. But again, let's assume we've picked them up We've discharged those pre-commencement conditions. There's no um, policy reason why we can't make a start on site. And we've got our preferred contractor. We're then kicking back into the world of uh, project management and, and project delivery, yeah. which is your area of expertise now. Yeah, that's right. And then it, it's, it's really getting into the construction phase at that point. So it's things like pre-start meetings on site with the client and all the stakeholders and the contractor. Um, reviewing the contractor's construction phase plan, things like that, making sure everyone's completely clear on on the construction program and and the sort of methodology of how things are going to be built, and then yeah, as, as soon as things start on the ground, we have sort of various, I guess, options of things we can do. But a lot of the time, it will be sort of key stage inspections. So we'll be there to to monitor the workmanship and the materials that are being used and the, and the quality of work. I guess to make sure that it, it complies with the specification that we've produced and it, it, it's as per the drawings we've done and it's it, it's yeah ultimately it's a sort of quality control thing to make sure that what's getting built is what was designed mm. and there's no no surprises there. And I guess from from our perspective as a, you know a, a consultancy STRI, our work is is out there to be seen basically. So it's very much in our interest to make sure that this is absolutely delivered to the specifications that we've set out in the design and that it looks its absolute best. So, you know, there's an incentive there for us, isn't there, really, to make sure that this is, is the best. It's, it's a in-situ advertisement, if you like, for our business. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and often during the construction, it's not just a monitoring. Obviously, you'll get some unforeseen things will happen during the course of a, of a contract. So it's been on hand to offer that technical design put at that stage if, if you come across something that yeah, you weren't anticipating you have to alter the design or redesign something you need to sort of be on hand to do that uh, on the spot basically that's when the, the sort of you know work quickly it's, it's on the hoof sort of stuff isn't it producing identifying an issue on site going away relooking at it redesigning and coming back as quickly as possible so there's no delay to the program or there's no there's no issues there yeah I guess that's a really good point you made that really because all the planning all the feasibility. Sometimes when you get on site, there's something that's uh, in the ground, let's say, that hasn't been accounted for, or maybe it's a, a, a local area circumstance that's come up. Maybe there's a traffic diversion on the day or something like that, or you know, there's a difficulty in getting materials to site or something along those lines. That's where it's important to react quickly, isn't it, and, and get a solution that's within the parameters of the uh, permission. Yeah, or the client might decide they want a change to something yeah. or they, they, for whatever reason there's been a been a change or a change in spec or they want to upgrade the higher spec or lower specs so yeah it's about 
just managing that process on the site and working with the contractor and the client as the sort of sort of the middle person to be the, the, the kind of technical person there reviewing it all and, and making sure it's all done properly. And then I guess just just to kind of wrap things up then, we've been through that process, the construction side of things uh, has gone along without any, any major difficulties and we've got the finished product. What's the kind of handover process that we go through then with the client in terms of them taking over uh, ownership or running, if you like, of the, of the facility? Yeah, we, we would be there to do a sort of final final sign-off, essentially, a final sign-off visit um, to make sure, yeah, that's the final step in the process, essentially, just to, um, I guess, cast our professional eye and make sure everything is, uh, is done as it was intended to be done um, and to review that any sort of operation and maintenance manuals that the contractor might provide to make sure that they're they're suitable and something that the client will be able to, to take on and sort of practically use moving forward. Um, and then often, and this might have happened at an earlier stage in the process, or it will have, talking about the longer term maintenance, but it's being there to support the client through the next stage of, so we of the just, life of that facility. Once they've taken ownership, we don't just cut off no. any sort of uh, connection to them at all. We're there to support them through the, the uh, at least the early stages and into the medium stages yeah, exactly. of that side. Because that's a big part of it. Because often in these sort of sports pitch projects, the way they're set up is that the contractor will maintain that facility for a period of time. Often it's a year. So the contractor, with all their specialist expertise and equipment, is maintaining that surface for a year. And then all of a sudden it's handed over to the client. And on that day, it's almost like you know, there you go. And so you need to be there to make sure that's a smooth transition mm. and the client's fully prepared to take on and, and do the maintenance that they need to do. And especially in the natural grass world, as we know, like the maintenance is going to change. You can't preempt that. Oh, it's going to depend on grass growth and the condition of the turf at the time and the weather conditions. So often it's a, a kind of last minute thing to advise the client on the optimal maintenance at that stage based on yeah, the condition of the facility at that point obviously it's going to be in good condition but i mean because it's going to be handed over but i just mean what are the growing conditions at that particular time of year and um some of the specifics around the maintenance they want to be doing okay great well i think that's you know gives hopefully a flavor of the uh, development process from start to finish how we approach things here at stri in terms of sports related developments and urban uh, environment developments Hopefully it's been useful um, to anybody that's listening and um, yeah, we'll see you on the next one.